comes all the patriots in on their bikes. Do what? jam up this parking lot. I'm not going anywhere until it's over anyway. Yeah, it looks like someone was going over there too. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess there's a lot of us. That's the Navy's birthday anyway. Yeah. 238 years. I think all these guys on the bikes met at another parking lot. When I was coming in, I seen them. The whole parking lot was full a few blocks away. There's so much sky in the background from down here, I may have to move my camera up there on top of the hills so you can see their face. Okay, here, let's keep this one. Uh huh. It looks like they're almost all in. And as we put out on our uh, schedule of events, the agenda, we're going to have uh, Sam McGinnis lead us uh, first with an opening prayer, and then he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So plenty of flags out here, so when we begin the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, just pick one, put your hand on your heart, and go for it. Thanks. All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to be here to pay respect and the honor that's due these veterans. Lord, I just want to thank you for each and every one that uh, whether they're here today or not, God, that has paid the sacrifice, Lord, and many that have paid the ultimate sacrifice, Lord, so that way we can have that freedom to be able to gather here today. Father, we just thank you for uh, their courage, their strength. Lord, we thank you for their families, Lord, and the support that they have given them. Lord, a lot of times it's just as hard on the families being away as it is those that are uh, fighting or serving on foreign soil or even here on the, in the States. God, we just love you and thank you for all that you do for us. God, I just pray that throughout today, Lord, that we would uh, just remember those that have uh, provided 
and have served and have given us this freedom, Lord, and defended it. God, I just pray that you would keep those that are right now that are serving here in the States and in Afghanistan and around the world, Lord. I pray, God, that you would keep them safe today, that you would put your hand of protection upon them and that they would uh, just be able to uh, come home and sleep tonight. Father, we just thank you for all that you've done for us, and we just want to give you the honor and the glory, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's go ahead and right hand salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If you're one of those uh, folks that came to uh, be involved in something that's going to have a lot of uh, flashy, impressive Hollywood production values, I'm going to have to tell you you're in the wrong place. If you're, uh, if you're looking for something like that, I don't know where you could go, but I was so just pumped up all week long of floating an idea out there that we should just do something. So many of us I know would go to Washington, D.C. to be there and support those veterans up there. To, to be at the epicenter of where things are going on that we're all very passionate about. But since I couldn't go up there, I figured I knew there were a lot of other people that could not go up there, so I floated that idea out there. Hey, what about something in South Carolina? Where could we go? What could we do? We've got a great state where our capital just happens to be slack dab in the middle of the state. And we had a park like this that we were able to uh, get permission from the Memorial Parks Commission to use. Put the word out. You guys did a fantastic job of when you saw the event posted, you told your friends, you told your neighbors, you told people that you ride with. And I appreciate that very much. Uh, I truly do. What we're going to do, I told you, uh, told you on uh, Facebook, I announced that we were going to do a little bit of singing. Some people can sing, some people can't, but if you're one of those people that uh, had to bring a bucket with you to carry your tune with, well, it's time to get your bucket out because Rose Merck is going to help us get started as we all sing together the national anthem and then uh, America the Beautiful. Thanks. Y'all have to help. <laughs>
Star Spangled Banner. That's going to give you a break a little while till we're going to require or ask for some more audience participation. <laughs> well, everybody knows what was kind of the impetus for getting together uh, with everybody here today was a little over a week ago, there were some World War II veterans that were up in Washington, D.C., and they were being blocked from their memorial. It's their memorial, it was open air, and many of us saw that as a profound act of disrespect. And so with what was going on in Washington, D.C. this weekend, we, many of us obviously felt that something needed to be done here in South Carolina, so it was just somebody like me, I just happened to be the one to put the word out there, and you guys responded. And I thank you so much for it. You guys have given me one heck of a week. Uh, getting to know people from all over the state uh, a heck of a week with very little sleep but a great week nonetheless when i was talking or thinking to myself about what i might say uh, to the crowd today to kind of get get this thing started um, my younger daughter that's not here with me today i was telling her one of the things i would like to do would be to ask uh, kids or children younger ones that might be at the rally what is it that they loved about America? What is it they loved about being in South Carolina? And I was mentioning that to, to Emily as part of just saying that might be part of what we do here today. And without hesitating, she looked at me and she says, what do you love about America, Dad? So I said, well, I said, I think what I love about America is the very dream of America, what it represents, the freedom and liberty, of opportunity, and to think that initially that dream was just spoken of in pubs and meeting houses, initially at just a whisper. Then that whisper got just a little bit louder and a little bit louder. And for that dream to take fruition and to become reality, it required a call to duty, to serve with honor, and to put your country first. Duty, honor, country. Everybody here that's ever served knows that in your heart and in your head. It may have been a long time since the government said, okay, you're free to go and kind of do what you want to do with your own time now, but that sense of duty, honor, and country never leaves you, and it's evidence of that is all around me, out in front of me here today. As I was thinking more about what I might say to the group this weekend, let me get my paper up here. I happened to stumble across a little bit of news uh, that I was, uh, was reading, and I got this off the internet. It's called The Conversation. And uh, this took place just 
just a couple of days ago on the Today Show. It says, this is a person reporting, this morning I was watching the Today Show and caught a segment on why Europeans are better at life than Americans. Examples they gave were cheese, cheese, and vacation time. Then they struggled to think of something Americans could do better than Europeans. And the discussion was accompanied by a chai run that read, well, American exceptionalism. Sometimes I think Matt Lauer suggested binge TV watching is something we do better. Then someone suggested cheese, says, I think we actually have some pretty good cheese. And then Savannah Guthrie said sarcastically, I like Velveeta. <laughs> That's what they came up with when they were talking about American exceptionalism. I think that's pretty pathetic. Matter of fact, I don't even want to hold that piece of paper. Because I think symbols of American exceptional, exceptionalism are all around us. American exceptionalism is portrayed in that Vietnam Memorial there. It's portrayed at that Korean War memorial over there is portrayed at that holocaust memorial there and at the uss columbia and at every memorial that's in this park and in every park that's like this in counties and towns and states that are all across this country how dare they say we're exceptional in garbage like cheese amen I think it's exceptional that beginning in 1941, we had young men and women all across this country of ours that left their homes, left school, ran away from high school, dropped out of college, left jobs as store clerks, mechanics, t selling tickets at movie theaters. I may stumble a little bit. I didn't bring my teleprompter, so y'all have to go with me. <laughs> But people left behind everything that they knew. And at that time, people still a lot of times had never left the state they were born in, maybe even the county that they were uh, from. But they left that to go to places on this planet that they had never heard of. You think a guy probably growing up somewhere over in 96 South Carolina had ever heard of a little place called Peleliu out in the Pacific? You think some guy coming along left a job in a textile mill somewhere here in South Carolina had ever heard of a place like Guadalcanal? You think they'd ever heard of places like Bastogne? You think they'd ever even probably never even heard of places like Pearl Harbor? But they left. They answered their call. Some did it voluntarily. Others answered when called. But they did it. They went around the world and at the end of 1945, there were more people on this planet breathing the air of freedom, waking up as free peoples who were formerly oppressed by either fascist Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan. And we did that right in four years time. I think that's exceptional. I may have just gone to public school and went to college as a, an adult later in life, and I'm no genius, but I think that's pretty exceptional. I want to talk about some exceptional South Carolinians right now. There was a project done by uh, Public TV here in South Carolina a couple years ago, and I actually caught it on television when they were uh, uh, broadcasting it. They were doing some DVDs, kind of a documentary, where they were talking with South Carolina veterans um, and getting a little bit of their story, a little bit of background information on them. And I'm going to share a few of them that I came across on that website. And these are just a, not even a handful because there were approximately 184,000 South Carolinians who fought in World War II. Charles Murray from right here in Columbia, South Carolina, born September 1921, was part of the U.S. Army 3rd Infantry Division. Colonel Charles, Charles Murray received the Medal of Honor in World War II. Charles died August 12, 2011. John Hernandez from Rock Hill, 
South Carolina. Served in the U.S. Army 18th Infantry Ref Regiment, 1st Infantry Division, Big Red One, hoo -ah. John Hernandez stormed the beaches of Normandy on D-Day in the second wave at Omaha Beach. He was later put on a ship headed to England. John says how he survived the invasion at Omaha Beach was pure luck. John received the French Legion of Honor. I gotta get a drink of water, hang on. It's just us. <laughs> I should have known better. I should have had one up here with me. You learn every day. <laughs> That's right. When you quit learning, you're dead. That's right. Yeah, ask Mark okay. Rubio. Leroy Bowman, Sumter, South Carolina. Hey. Was born in September 1921. U.S. Army Air Corps, 332nd Fighter Squadron. For those of you that don't know, that's the Tuskegee Airmen. Wow. Leroy was an African American. Now, you want to talk about, I mean, obviously we know now there were some things done that were not right in our country at that time, prejudices. Going to war in World War II and in any war is hard enough, but when you go and you're fighting some prejudices amongst your, your, your own citizens and getting equipment slowly that might be cut rate and not resupplied like other units might, you want to read some impressive information. You watch some documentaries on the all black units and you will find out some stories of real courage. And on behalf of those gentlemen, I'd just like to say that I'm glad that finally in recent years, they've been getting the recognition that it was long deserved. That was an injustice done to those great gentlemen. And it's good to see that within the last several years, we're making amends for it. So that was Leroy Bowman, Tuskegee Airman. Doris Brandenburg from Ellery, South Carolina. She was born in August of 1919. She is a U.S. Army nurse. Doris Brandenburg took over the hospital in France and set up a ward for German POW patients. She worked at the 12th General Hospital Unit in Italy and then later worked in a hospital in North Africa. Gerald Polk. He was originally from, uh, well, he's, they have him as being from Asilla, Georgia, but he was born in Barnwell, so he's one of us. Gerald Polk jumped into Normandy on D-Day and then fought in Operation Market Garden, and anybody knows something about history, Market Garden was a, a fiasco, and if those guys had jumped in there, it wasn't a picnic. He also fought at Battle of the Bulge. And apparently Gerald uh, did not suffer from a lack of modesty because when he was interviewed, he said it was actually me and Eisenhower who won the war. <laughs> yeah, Gerald was known for his humility and sense of humor, I'm sure. Lou Fowler from right here in Columbia was part of the 454th Bombardment Wing. Lou Fowler was a tail gunner on a B-24. On his 24th mission, his plane was shot down. He was thrown from the plane and parachuted to the ground where he was rescued by Yugoslavian, the Yugoslav underground before being captured by the Nazis eventually. He was beaten and tortured as a POW and witnessed executions at Auschwitz. He camped, he escaped to safety in 1944 when a group of fellow POWs escaped their prison camp and were liberated by fellow American soldiers. Mason Mickey Dorsey from Johns Island, 3rd Army, 71st Cav Recon. Mickey Dorsey was part of a reconnaissance crew leading Patton's 3rd Army through France and Germany and helped liberate concentration camps. Moffett Burris from Columbia, South Carolina. Moffett lost his brother in a POW camp. He liberated, oh, I'm sorry, I missed, he was 504, 504th Parachute Infantry, 82nd Airborne Division. We got, we got another one of you 82nd bros up here be speaking to you in just a minute. Moffitt lost his brother in the POW camp. He liberated concentration camps and made townspeople bury their dead. He crossed the Wall River and fought in the invasion of Sicily and Italy, the liberation of Holland, and the Battle of the Bulge. Alice Ray, West Columbia, South Carolina. She was born in 1927 in January. Alice is originally from the Orangeburg area, and after her father was killed in a car accident. She left her, this left her mother to care for four children. As soon as the Charleston Navy Yard began to recruit women, Alice and her sister Julia signed up and worked as welders through the end of World War II. Alice Ray, one of Rosie's riveters. 
Greer Taylor from Leesville, South Carolina. Born in September 1922, he was assigned to the 95th Medical Gas Treatment Unit during the war. Taylor spent six weeks carrying Jewish survivors from a train leaving Bergen-Belsen to a nearby hospital. In 2011, Greer received a grateful phone call from a woman whose father had been on that train. Odell Vaughn from Spartanburg, South Carolina, 178th Field Artillery Battalion. Vaughn enlisted in the National Guard at 17. He was sent overseas to England just a few months after he was married. He served in England, North Africa, and Italy. While serving in Italy, Vaughn was attempting to help a wounded soldier trapped in a minefield. Moving closer, Vaughn stepped on a landmine and was critically wounded. As a result of his injury, Vaughn would eventually lose both his legs. He was awarded the Silver Star and the Purple Heart and the French Croix de Guerre for his unselfish actions during battle. In 1972, Richard Nixon appointed Vaughn to be the Chief Benefits Director for the National Veterans Administration, and later Gerald Ford recognizing his outstanding service in fighting for legislation and programs to aim, aid veterans named him Deputy Administrator for the entire VA system. That was Odell Vaughn from Spartanburg. <laughs> this is a, an obituary for a, uh, a World War II veteran that just passed away recently that was, that was brought handed to me. But we're gonna go ahead and read this, add this to the group, he deserves it. Finley Forrest Morrison Jr. April 1921 to October 2013 from Hartsville, South Carolina. Funeral services for Finley Forrest Morgan Jr., aged 92. Same age as many of those veterans that were in Washington just last week. He passed away on October 5th. Okay, he joined the Army on December 16th, 1942. He trained at Fort Knox, Kentucky in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. He served under General Mark Clark as a tank and half-track commander with the 4th Tank Battalion, 5th Armored Division. His tours included Naples, Foggia, and Rome, Italy, as well as Po Valley and the Anzio Beachhead in, at the Anzio Beachhead Invasion. Decorations include the American Campaign Theater Medal, the, uh, I can't pronounce that one, probably the MA Campaign Medal with four bronze stars, Forrest grew up on a farm and he, before he started his own automobile business in Hartsville. So there was a South Carolina farm boy that went off and fought for his country. You're gonna tell me that there's nothing exceptional about the United States of America. I'd like for, for them to, those people who said those things, if they had the guts, I'd like for them to be here I'd like for them to look at some of these Vietnam veterans that are walking around here and say America's not exceptional. Some of the World War II veterans that would like to be here. By the way, do we have any World War II veterans that were able to show up? They didn't know if we did or not. I'd ask for some, but I know at this, at this time in their lives it's, it's difficult for a lot of those men. And sadly, we're losing 600 to 1,000 of them a day. So I would just beseech you that when you're out and about, grocery shopping, walking through Walmart, wherever you are. If you see one of those gentlemen with the World War II veteran thing on, I try to make a habit of it. Walk up and say thank you and shake their hand. I've met some really interesting people that way in Greenville anyway. So walk up and say thank you because we don't have time on our side to let that generation know how much we appreciate what they did. Had they not done what they did, as I finish here, had they not done what they did, paid for it in blood and guts and their lives and in time away from their families and then came back home to build this nation into the most powerful, the most prosperous nation on the planet. That's not exceptional. They were the generation that came back that put things in place that put a man on the moon. The American flag is the only flag that is sitting on the surface of another planet that was put there by a human being. And that was an American that did that. You tell me America's not exceptional, I want to say you're crazy. But thank you all from the bottom of my heart for being here and being part of this. And again, when you see those World War II guys out there, even now, there's been, it's been a while since the Korean War 
I was in Korea, uh, stationed there. That's some tough terrain, let me tell you. Them boys had it rough over there. You see those guys, as that generation's getting older, walk up and shake their hands. There is a brotherhood that connects us across the years. That's what got me so riled up the other day is those men are older than what my grandfather lived to be. But that's why I kept referring to them as my elder brothers in arms. Those were our big brothers. It wasn't right. We're here today to honor them, and I thank you for it. Thank you very much. All right, so we can get back and announce the next speaker so you know who's coming up, jumping ahead of myself. Uh, this is Ben Bracewell. He's a veteran of the 82nd Airborne and served two tours in Afghanistan. Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, I'm not really used to public speaking or anything like that, so I did have to bring some notes. I'm going to be looking down every once in a while. I've got a lot of things that I felt like... I need to say, I'm not going to speak too long, but uh, when I first found out about this march, my first, my first thought was, all right, well, where's something going down in South Carolina and how can I get involved? And, and my first thought was, well, I got to get started and we got to set this up and we got to get going. I started looking around and next thing you know, I found out that John and, John and these folks were already 95 miles an hour running down the road with this idea. They were, they were just going right to it. So. Uh, I just want to say thank you to John and everybody else that helped to organize this. They did a great job getting the word out and everything, so, so thanks to these guys. <laughs> Next, I want to stop and I want to, I want to just talk to a minute to my fellow veterans. Whether you served in World War II, Vietnam, or Korea, or wherever you served, I just need to say thank you. You set the stage for people like me, and you made it possible for me to wear the uniform. For those that went before me, it was an honor to follow you. And for those of you that stood beside me in the global war on terror, it was a privilege to serve with you. To those of you that didn't serve in the military, but you're still here, I wanna say thank you to each and every one of y'all. Your presence means something, it means a lot. It means something to each and every single veteran because it shows that you care. It shows respect for our fallen brothers. It shows a commitment to heroes that gave everything and made the ultimate sacrifice so we can continue to live in a truly incredible nation. And lastly, I just want to stop for a minute and I want to, I want to kind of send up a little bit of a message to anyone that thought it was a good idea to shut our memorials down. Anywhere, for any reason, it's not ever the right answer. Anybody that's taken part in or had anything to do with shutting down our memorials, they just made a big mistake. They just messed with the greatest brotherhood that this world has ever seen. The Brotherhood of American Military Veterans. Now these memorials, they're just made out of stone. But to so many people, they mean so much more than that. It's a symbol, it's a representation of something much, much bigger. It represents friendships that you won't find anywhere else except in the US military. It represents a depiction, or it is a depiction that stands for what we believe in and the freedom this country was founded on. It's a commitment to a nation so great that men voluntarily put their lives on the line for it. These memorials are a place to grieve, a place to honor, a place to pay respects one more time. And to try, and I say try because they didn't succeed, but to try and shut those down is an insult to each and every single veteran out there is an insult to the families of those that died and it is an insult to the memories of our fallen brothers to use our memorials as a bargaining chip as a pawn for your political games is a slap in the face to the men that died fighting for this great nation our fallen brothers my fallen friends and our fallen americans deserve better So when you try and shut our memorials down, this right here is what you get. You get a response from veterans all over this country, traveling all the way to DC, traveling all the way to Columbia, with patriot Ameri patriotic Americans behind them, standing up and rallying for what we believe in. This brotherhood took Normandy Beach, they took the sands of Iwo Jima, 
They patrolled the jungles of Vietnam. They walked the mountains of Afghanistan. And they marched on the streets of Iraq. And now, all those different generations are gathered together at memorials all over this country today. At our memorials to remember our fallen. We gather because we remember. Never forget. Thank you. Never. Thank you, Ben. Young man did a good job representing the 82nd, didn't he? Yeah. Appreciate it. Our next speaker is Jeff Maddox. Jeff is not a veteran himself, but his father was a 30-year Air Force veteran and a chaplain through some of the more difficult times of uh, American military, cultural, uh, social history. So Jeff's going to speak to us a little bit about his experiences, what he saw there. Jeff. Thank you. Um, Thank everybody for coming out. This is a great crowd. Uh, as John said, my, my dad was a 30-year career Air Force chaplain. He went in in 1966 at the height of Vietnam. And, uh, you know, growing up as a kid in the military, active duty military, we're always moving and, and uprooting our family and following our, our active duty parents whether they be men or women, all over the world. And I, I saw a lot. I saw a lot of the world. I saw all of Europe. I saw the sun come over the top of Mount McKinley in Alaska when we were stationed in Allison Air Force Base. But I, I, I did miss my dad. My dad was gone a lot of the times during that period of time, and it wasn't until years later that I found out that he was out consoling people families that had lost loved ones over in Vietnam. I, I really hated my father because of that, because I, I didn't have him there. You know, he wasn't there to play ball with me. He wasn't there to help me work on little cars. He wasn't there. And it wasn't until years later that I realized I paid a small price. I, I can go now and I can talk to him. I can touch him. I can feel him. And all the people around me that my friends that are lost loved ones can't do that. And so it, it was a small sacrifice for me. I didn't think so at the time. Military families go through a lot. They suffer a lot. Their, their loved ones are overseas for sometimes years at a time. I remember in Vietnam, Dad was over in 69 and uh, we used to get these reel-to-reels and, and we'd all sit around, Mom and, and my two, my brother and my sister, and listen to Dad's voice. And then we'd turn around and we'd make one of those and we'd send it off. People don't realize, people outside of the military don't realize what, what families go through the sacrifice they make. The sacrifice that the families make for freedom. Sometimes it's hard to understand as a youngster. I know I didn't. I know kids today don't understand what's happening. They might see it on TV and all, but it really doesn't click in their head. And I just hope that all of us can remember that it's the families that suffer too. The other thing is, all these people out here fought for freedom and liberty. We cannot forget that we've got the same duty, the same honor, duty on our country. As civilians, we have that same obligation. We have to be vigilant. And we've lacked in that vigilance. Our trouble's not, in, uh, not with politicians. It's not with the government. It's with us. We, don't, we ha haven't been as vigilant as we need to be. And I challenge every one of you to get involved. Get involved at your local level, get involved at your state level, and get involved with your federal level. Until we get vigilant about freedom, a vigilant about liberty, standing for the Constitution, standing for the Bill of Rights. Until we do that, our country is going, going down to hell. So 
remember the families, remember the fallen, remember all these fellow soldiers that, that have gone all over the world. But remember, it's here, it's here that we have to stand. And it's here that we have to protect liberty. I'm not going to say any more. I don't need to be long-winded. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all for serving. God bless America. Our next speaker is going to be Rose Merck. Rose was a corpsman in the Navy, Vietnam era, and she's going to share some of her stories and remembrances right now with us. You good to go? I just got to say, Rose is a sweetheart, if, and, and her husband, Ron, if it weren't for them, we'd be standing up here hollering at each other because they were the ones that... Uh, allowed us to use a PA system, sound system that was theirs. And when I met them, uh, it was Friday, Friday night. When we met, we coordinated, met at a uh, nice little Mexican place uh, just outside of uh, Greenville area. I met them, I felt like I was sitting down having dinner with old friends. It was really good. They're just great people. Thank you guys. And I apologize first because I wasn't supposed to sing. So. <laughs> you did good. But when you're called, you answer the call. And when he asked me if I would represent the female veterans, I didn't really respond well because all I did was my job. And that's all I did. And when I started thinking about my family and how far back we go, and looking at our own history, and women were a big part of military forces all the way back to 1775. Amen. You know, it wasn't... It wasn't until the 20th century... Oh, no. <laughs> One way to shut me up in <laughs> All righty. You know, it wasn't until the 20th century that positions were actually formed for those who cooked the meals and those who mended the clothes and those who tended to the ill and the wounded. It was the women who stepped up. They didn't get paid. They just stepped up. They backed their men. They backed their brothers. Women, there's a place for you in this world. You're being called upon. Whether you're a mother that has a son that's serving, a grandmother, a daughter that's wondering, what am I going to do with my life? There is a place for you. There were jobs that were opened up my mother was with the, the uh, Women's Army Corps. Y'all know them as a WAC. Okay? <laughs> the WACs were the Army women. The WASPs were the Air Force women, which originally were the WACs doing Air Force duties because the Air Force didn't allow women. Um, I come from an era where my platoon was actually the first one to ever bear arms. You know, females didn't have those kind of duties. Fortunately, in today's world, females make up 20% of the military. My numbers could be wrong. But women, there are a place for you. I want to thank the women that have prayed for the troops. I want to thank you for praying for your children. I want to thank you for, for serving your country in any manner possible. The USO. If you just stayed home and sewed patches on your husband's uniform. There's no just to any service we women do. We think we're just doing our jobs. And after the World Wars, both of them, women were sent back. They, were, they had been called out 
to take over some of the, the tasks, the clerical duties, so that the men could go out to the battlefields. Today, women are on the battlefields. I'm no feminist. I love that my husband opens doors. You are, Keith. So without further ado, Keith Rusegger. Hello, Patriots. Hello. Please bear with me on this. This is an emotional issue for me. and I, I always break down. I'm not a public speaker, but I'm a patriot that loves this country. I'm standing up here shaking, but by God, I watched 80-year-old World War II veterans in wheelchairs knock them barriers down in D.C. If they got the guts to do that sitting in a wheelchair, I can have the guts to stand up here. I'm not a veteran. My dad served in World War II, he flew bombers. His handle was Eagle One. That's why on this bike that I built in dedication to every veteran out here, this Eagle flies over top. He, he goes everywhere with me. God, I love you. Dad, I love you. Please give me the words that I need to say. I'm here to represent a civilian population that you veterans probably don't see much. You don't hear much on the media, in the media, and you probably don't see a whole lot of in the general public. But let me tell you something, I'm here to represent civilians and patriots who love this country, appreciate the freedom that you've given, that you defended for us. The freedom that I have to raise my family in the best country in the world. The freedom that I have to, to worship how I see fit. The freedom I have to get on a motorcycle, wind in my face, bugs in my teeth, and go anywhere I want to go. I can leave home when I want to. I don't have to stop from state to state and show papers and ask you questions or answer any damn body's questions. Excuse my French. The only time I have to be home is when my wife says to be home. And I'm gonna tell you something, riding this bike, I've been, I've been riding motorcycles since I was 16 years old. First thing I did, one of the first things I did was ride my bike with my dad. I grew up in Florida, in Florida at 16 you could ride a motorcycle. I know, it's crazy, but anyway, he taught me to ride a bike, little Honda 75, and I grew from there with a bike and size. But he used to always joke, he never talked much about his service, but every time I'd bring it up, he'd kind of kid. You see, our last name's Rooksegger. That has German heritage to it. And he used to say, son, the only thing I worried about was, the only thing I thought about when I released those bombs was, was I bombing my ancestors. He said, that's the only thing I worried about. He said, because, and I felt bad, because they never got to experience the freedom that America provides, and that I'm standing up for, and that I fought for. That's about all he would say. He, he, he said very little. Out of the other World War II veterans that I've met, they're pretty shy people. Well, most of them. Um, they don't talk a lot about their service. They went over there as kids. They fought. They put their lives on the line. They came back here. They went through the Great Depression. They built this country into what it is today. Absolutely. Amen. And for anybody anybody to keep them out of their memorial just ticks me off. Yeah. That's why I'm here today. I've, ha I've had the honor. How many civilians do we have today here today? Never served in your life. Look at this, veterans. Please, you don't have to just show up to rallies. I mean, there are people out there. There are people in there. There's millions in this country that 
thank and love and appreciate what you've done for us. So when you're sitting at home one night, maybe you're sitting there wondering, watching this so-called news media, and you wonder, does anybody in this country care anymore? Please know that I'm only one out of millions that will stand beside you right now. If it takes tomorrow, the, you decide to watch on, uh, march on D.C. and take this country back, well, my God, I'm with you this time. I disappointed my dad when I was growing up. Like a lot of teenagers, I went stupid. <laughs> and did a lot of stupid things. But when I finally found my brains again, he was almost gone. And from that day forward, the day we put him in the ground was the day I decided that I'm gonna do everything that I could possibly do to support his memory and to support our veterans and to support the freedom that he and all of you fought for. But you know, it took me a couple years of struggling. What do I do? You know, I, I love to ride motorcycles, that was great. You know, but what do I do? How do I show veterans? And how do I display my patriotism, my love of country, and my thank you to our veterans? I didn't know what to do. Many of you here today as civilians may not know what to do. You show up to rallies like this, and or you go home and hopefully when you see a veteran eating dinner or something you shake their hand maybe buy their dinner say thank you but there are thousands of organizations out here that you can get involved with to support these veterans now i love to ride bikes so a couple of friends of mine about 10 years ago talked me into going to an event called rolling thunder in washington I'd never been there before, never heard of it. I said, cool, sounds like a nice bike rally. So I thought I was going to Sturgis. Uh, wow. For those of you who don't know what Rolling Thunder in D.C. is, let me just explain something to you. <clears throat> There's bikers, 99% of them, I would guess, are veterans, ride their bikes to Washington, D.C. from all over this country. The last time I was there, there was Canadian veterans parked right beside me at the Pentagon. There's rides that leave from California and cross this country to go to D.C. on Memorial Weekend every year in Washington, D.C. I don't care if you're a veteran or a civilian. Once in your life, be in Washington, D.C. Memorial Day weekend. Why? 500,000 plus motorcycles roll in. They fill up the Pentagon parking lots. At high noon, by God, that thunder rolls. It takes four to five hours to get out of the Pentagon parking lot. That thunder rolls through the streets of D.C. And it's not in empty streets. There's hundreds of thousands of people lining the streets in support of this. It's not a protest. It's not a parade. It is a demonstration. I stood there in absolute awe. Now, this is 10 years ago. I've been there about six times since. I walked up on the hill and as far as I could see was motorcycles. And then we started moving. Needless to say, I, thought, I don't know how I got through it. I couldn't see for the, the dust was in my eyes and, and, and tears were just flowing. And then we turned that corner, we passed Arlington, we turned that corner right at the, the Lincoln Memorial getting ready to go on to Constitution. And here's a Marine in full dress. Tim Chambers. Stand there, full salute. Never drop that salute. He's done it every year. Stands there four or five hours in respect of what these guys are doing. Why do they do this? And most of these are Vietnam veterans. They do it to remind those brainless idiots up on the hill Never forget. Yeah. Bring them all home. Yeah. And through those efforts, they are today still bringing remains home from Vietnam. I had to honor, well, I'll get to that in a minute, but what can civilians do to support our veterans? I love to ride motorcycles. So I went to that. I said, man, that just blew me away. That's only a one year event. I started looking around and come across 
an organization a few years ago. It's called the Patriot Guard. Yeah. Now, I want to say a disclaimer here. I'm I'm going to tell you my experiences with the Patriot Guard. <clears throat> the Patriot Guard is not a political organization. Um, they do not participate in political events. But I got permission to mention the Patriot Guard here today from Randy Steve <laughs> Stevens because he said that patriotism needs to be vocalized. Oh. <laughs> For those of you that don't know what the Patriot Guard is, I looked it up on a website, you know, and Back when I joined, it was just a ragtag bunch of groups of bikers. We were, we didn't know what we were doing. But one day I, I heard about it on the internet that in Kansas, there was a group of veterans who saw some idiot protesters protesting at a fallen hero's funeral. These guys were Vietnam veterans. And if memory serves me correctly, they were members of the American Legion. You know what they said? They said, hell no. This will not happen to our guys again. They started out with a handful of bikers, a handful of patriots, and today we have over 250,000 members nationwide. You want to become a member of something? You don't have to be a, you don't, you don't have to ride a motorcycle. You don't have to be a veteran. All you gotta do is be able to stand and hold a flag and show respect and honor to that veteran or that fallen hero. Stand on the street corner as the procession goes by and hold a flag. Say thank you. Send an email to the family. That You can get involved that way. There's the Honor Flight organization. I recently became involved with it. Well, I've been through the PGR. I've been going to a lot of these Honor Flights where they send these World War II veterans to D.C. for the day they give them the hero's treatment, they come back, and there's a huge reception for these guys. The true hero's welcome that they deserve at the airport. Loved it, did a lot of them. And I said, I want to get more involved in this. What do I got to do? So I contacted the organization. <laughs> Needless to say, I had the honor last month, September 12th, of being on the 300th honor flight out of Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina from U.S. Air. <laughs> They were so big they had to get an extra plane um, between, between the World War II vets, the media, and all the hoopla that went along with it. But let me tell you something. These guys in wheelchairs, now, I had the honor to escort two World War II veterans. They were brothers, the Wingo brothers out of Spartanburg, South Carolina. They told me, Keith, you're going to get two to escort. I said, okay, I'm a big guy, but I can't carry two people. <laughs> They said, well, they're, they're both in good shape, no problem. If you have a problem, we'll take care of it. I said, okay. Um, as a guardian, you can volunteer, you can be a guardian. You can be an escort. You can go on these trips with these World War II veterans. They're getting ready to start for Korean veterans, and then they're gonna go to Vietnam veterans. But you can actually go on these trips, spend a day with them. We take off at the airport, we land in DC, they got a hero's welcome. I'm talking about from the runway, the taxiway to the airport was lined with U.S. Air employees holding flags. They got the fire trucks out there doing, what do you call it, the cannon salute, the water salute, giving the, the airplane a bath. Um, in the airport, there were thousands to greet these guys here. They had a police escort to the World War II Memorial. And you know what? When I was watching this on TV, watching these 80-year-olds kick those barriers down, I don't doubt for one second the guys on that flight would have done the same thing. These guys were the greatest generation for a reason. And I think by doing what they did that day, they've sparked something in this country. I pray that they've sparked something in this country. So please, I'm asking you as a, as a, as a civilian, do something. If you're sitting at a restaurant, you got a veteran sitting there, you know one of the things I like to do and I've seen done, and I've got my kids doing it now, is if they're sitting there eating lunch, they got a hat on or whatever, um, 
walk up, shake their hand, say, thank you for your service. I got your lunch. One of my sons the other day, he went and he said, uh, Dad, I just couldn't go up to the man. He said, I bought his lunch and told the waitress, it's on me. Tell him thank you for his service. He just couldn't, he, he, he couldn't do it. The man was in a wheelchair, couldn't hardly breathe. I don't know if he lived the next day. Um, there's something else I need to say while I'm up here. I don't need to be long-winded, but by God, I love this country, and I love every veteran that's sitting here today and every veteran in this country. The World War II veterans and the Vietnam veterans have a special place in here for me. World War II veterans, because a lot of them remember, remind me of my dad, and because God knows what this country would be without them. And secondly, the Vietnam veterans, they were spit on when they came home. They were called baby killers. They were treated like garbage. And now they're in the White House. Okay? And what, what have I seen through the Patriot Guard, through Rolling Thunder, and through a lot of these veterans, these guys, Vietnam veterans today, are standing up and saying to the kids that are serving today, you will be treated better and you will get respect when you come home. <laughs> Every Vietnam veteran out there, God bless you and God bless America. I don't know if y'all could tell or not, but he's generally pretty shy. Um, our next speaker, uh, I was glad uh, to uh, find out about. Actually, uh, Jeff Maddox is the one who uh, brought him to my attention. He is a retired Marine Corps Sergeant Major, Larry Rizval. So everybody that's out there, you better be on your best behavior because Sergeant Major's in the house. <laughs> Good afternoon, Columbia, South Carolina. We want D.C. to hear us. We want all the state capitals in the state and this nation to send back a message to D.C. You know, each generation had a lot of things to overcome. My grandfather was a World War I veteran, rose to the occasion. Many veterans for World War II are monuments all across this park and other parks. They rose to the occasion. A lot of people forget about the, the sacrifices and the casualties. As a Marine, you think of Iwo Jima, uh, you know, all the battles, Guadalcanal, uh, Okinawa, they were horrible. The largest amphibious landing, though, went on D-Day, and it was done by the United States Army. They did one heck of a good job, did they not? Yeah. We also forget, we also forget about the highest casualties of all the branches, even more than the Marine Corps, it hit the islands, was the United States Air Force. Over 50% of them guys flying those bombers did not come back. It was horrible. We forgot about those guys who rose and stood for us. But our country recently has closed the gates on them during this government shutdown, which is totally unsat. Each generation following World War II had their own battles. The Korean conflict, right after World War II, the government started neutering the military. The, the company grade officers in the army were removed, sent home, it's time to get out, we don't need them anymore, we have this special bomb, the nuclear, the atom bomb at the time. The NCOs, the enlisted leadership within the, the army was gutted, sent out home. Five years later, the Korean War conflict came, caused by the agreements made during the World War II war. We got our butts handed to us by a third world country. We had to rise up and kick butt, and we, we survived this. We never signed a war agreement. We're still involved in that conflict to this day. Following the Korean War came the Vietnam War. My generation, I just missed it. I was just a little bit too young. I signed up as the last battle of the, uh, of, uh, the Vietnam War. The MIG was, was taking place. I was swearing into the late entry program to join the Marine Corps. Wound up being an infantryman. Served 28 years, two months and 11 days. Who was counting? Had a, had, had a wonderful time. Absolutely would do it again to this day. But I need the American people to be behind us. I'll tell you, when I got back from Desert Storm and I'm flying in, I had two kids at home. My daughter didn't even know what I looked like. If I was standing up in a lineup with a bunch of other Marines, she wouldn't know which one I was because I was gone all the time. I got off that airplane in Maine 
and the customs made us get off the airplane. I said, what are we getting off the airplane for? This is crazy. The airport at 2 o'clock in the morning had Americans standing up there wanting to thank us. I was the company gunny of a rifle company, and I was bawling like a baby. I was hiding my tears the best I could. Kids, kids wanted us to sign their t-shirts because we were heroes in their mind. We were just average Americans who stood that particular battle and we were being thanked. You're here today because we couldn't be up at DC. I wish I was at DC with them right now. The battle we're having going up, well, let me back up just a minute. This is the month of October, 1983. We had Beirut. Beirut, the State Department got involved and told them that weapons had to be unloaded. They're standing in a foreign country surrounded by Muslims and their weapons were unloaded. The State Department says, for quality of life, we need our Marines to move into that barracks. The commander underground said, no, I want them in the ground dispersed so that they can't get killed. We all know what happened in 1983 this month. Following that, we came Desert Storm. Following Desert Storm, we had another president. That president decided that he was it's time to cut the military. He cut all the branches. The Marine Corps was kind of left alone. Uh, the Army got cut in half. They went from 900 plus thousand to 400 and some thousand. That cut forced the National Guard to become the sustaining force for them when, they, when the army got activated into combat. That's why our National Guard men and women are being deployed, and instead of being like a Marine infantryman that goes over for six or seven months and comes back, they're over there for a year, a year and a half. They didn't sign up for that, but they are doing it, they rose to the occasion. Another story of Americans standing up for what's right. Now, it's our turn. Now we got a government shutdown. There's been many government shutdowns in the past. Never, never before in the history of our great country has the National Mall been barricaded by signs. This morning, I looked at a, a video where they had to cut the wires. They went back and re-put the signs, the gates back up and had them wired together. And they went in there with hacksaws and cut them. Before I left to come over, you're right. Before I left to come over here, they picked up those, those gates and they walked over to the White House yep. and stacked them in front of the White House. <laughs> if you go over and look at the, the pictures, you all know the famous uh, picture of the Marines raising the flag at Mount Sarabachi. Well, there was a bunch of Marines, you could tell because they had their USMC shirts on, and they were posing on top of the wire or the gates, another <laughs> mo monument of the uh, picture of the uh, Iwo Jima monument. Because that gate today is still closed, and veterans could not go there. This is sad. 29 service men and women have passed away here this last week, and never in the history of our great nation have we refused to pay death beneficiary benefits to, to uh, the loved ones. When I was on active duty years ago, it used to be like $5,000. That money was meant to offset the expenses of the family to take care of those loved ones so they could get to the funeral. Because the money stops when you, when you have a loved one that dies, the bank account shuts off. The money stops. The bank accounts get locked up. That money was there, handed to them in a check so they had cash that they could go do the things they need to do for their loved one so that they could do the right responsible, the, give them the honor they deserve. That was cut off. That was, thank God some people rose up and, and later they were signed off and now it's being returned back out there. But it should have never, it should have never ever been a, a topic of discussion. <laughs> let, let me tell you something. My, when that Beirut thing happened, I was in uh, Third Battalion, Six Marines. Um, across the street from me, was a Marine that was in 1-8. 1-8 was the battalion that got blown up. This young Marine, he was a corporal, married, had two kids. He was in the Army prior to coming in the Marine Corps. And when he was in the Army, he was a Humvee mechanic. When he joined the Marine Corps, they made him an infantryman. So he put in a lap move request 
in a re-enlistment request and they approved his lap move. They pulled him out of the trenches where the Marines were sleeping, the, the infantry, the grunts, if you will, and put him in the barracks. That night is when they hit the bomb and left a wife and two kids, a, a young corporal. It was horrible. The gates at Camp Lejeune, base housing, Terrebonne Terrace, was open. It was an open gate base. You could go on to the Terrebonne Terrace. The media had swarmed in and were harassing these young brides with their just lost their husband and had to take care of their kids. You know, you're talking corporals and sergeants. Terrebonne Terrace was for NCO housing. Corporals and sergeants, E4s and E5s. They're 19 to 22 years of age. And they're running in, and, and it was just absolutely horrible. So by seeing, by seeing you all here today, and all the things that are going on across this great nation, we must stand and demand that our veterans can be taken care of, and we got to take care of our country. Please get involved. Thank you, Sergeant Major. I tell you what, it's nice to have a few people that come in and participate in this stuff with the experience and real world expertise uh, in some of these things like the Sergeant Major, Major did. And uh, man, you just, you just I, I told Jeffy to hit a home run for me personally when he got him to agree to come talk to us. <laughs> our next guest, our next speaker is somebody that uh, if you haven't heard of him, heard from him before, uh, hopefully you'll be hearing a whole lot more about him in uh, coming months, and this is South Carolina State Senator Lee Bright. It's great to be a patriot. I also saw that today where they were moving the, the uh, barricades. You know, let's think back, and, and I, I know we owe, we owe a certain degree of, of uh, respect to the office. No, we don't. But this guy in the White House, he don't have anymore. <laughs> let's think about this. This guy was trained by Jane Fonda and her crowd. <laughs> he loves this fight the way he can treat our veterans. Well, let me tell you, I love you and I appreciate what you've done for our country because it's the veterans. When you look at what Patrick Henry talked about, life being so sweet and peace being so sweet. When Patrick Henry talked those words, about how well, what you would not be willing to risk for the chains of slavery. When Patrick Henry said those words, he was talking about veterans because veterans have been there and done that. They put their lives on the line for this country. And it breaks my heart to have a president who would do what he's done in the past few weeks. I mean, I just, I'm just in total shock. I mean, this is supposed to be our commander in chief. But I gotta tell you something, those veterans up there today in Washington, and you that have made it here, have made this stand to show, and this is the beginning, this is a tidal wave. We're taking our country back. <laughs> My grandfather served in World War II. He was in North Africa. My father was over in Vietnam. He was in the Navy, served over there. And our veterans come back, and they have to wait for the health care that they've earned. We've got this Obamacare system where I serve, I serve in the state senate and, and that's what all this shutdown's about. This is about Obamacare. They're trying to distract us. They're trying to cause pain, but it comes down to Obamacare. We had a guy come down here who was an expert on Obamacare and told us we didn't need nullification and was telling us all the things that weren't in the Obamacare bill. But in the end, it was my turn to ask a question. And I said, sir, you've flown down from Washington. I have only one question for you. Have you read the bill? He said, no. He was the expert to come down here and tell us about Obamacare. This is a scourge to our land, an absolute scourge. It's gonna take away our independence. Right. Everything that you that's exactly right. Everything that y'all fought for, that bill's gonna take away from us. Because what it's gonna do is it's gonna make us fully reliant on our health care to the government. We're slaves. And that's exactly right. Our freedom is being taken away, and it's been taken a little at a time because the government has come to us and said we can provide it for you. No, 
No matter what it is, they can provide it for you, and each time a little bit of our liberty is lost. There are only two groups that can take away your freedom. Only two. The government and criminals. Now, our system that y'all fought for is for a government to protect us from the criminals. That's what this system's about. But throughout history, governments have done more to take away rights than criminals have ever done. So we're going to... We're going to have to fight for our freedoms. And I want to tell you another thing. I was talking to a veteran just the other day, and he was talking about PTSD and the, the gun grab that's going on. And let me tell you something. That, the president and these folks up in D.C. are afraid of veterans because they know that you're willing to fight for your freedom. That's right. Yeah. And by God, they ought to be afraid of what they're trying to do up there. So y'all just keep up the fight. I've got you back in Columbia, and I hope to have you back in Washington here in about six months. Just today, you had Ted Cruz and Sarah Palin, Palin and Mike Lee up there today, and Sarah Palin made the comment to Barack Obama about the Veterans Memorial, and he said, Mr. President, tear down these barricades. Just like our president had to say to a Russian president about tearing down a wall right. around our monument. This is our property, this is our country, and this is our freedom, and it's time we tell those folks in Washington, hands off, we're taking it back. I, I want to thank you for being here. God bless you for being here. And, and for those of you that have served, we owe you this freedom we have. I, when I stand in that well in the Senate and raise the cane that I raise, there's one reason I can do that. There's one reason I can stand behind this microphone right now today, and that's the veteran. And I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lee. Lee Bright. Well, now is the time I do see we have some young ones uh, out there. Uh, this young gentleman right there in that Clemson shirt if you would like to come speak with us i would like for you to tell the crowd and don't worry about it because it's just us and i won't hurt i'm working on becoming good grandpa material one of these days so if you would just come up here and just in in 60 seconds or so just tell us what it is you love about america so what's your name robbie robbie okay robbie as far as from what you've heard today and everything, what is it you love about America and love about living in South Carolina? Hey. That people died for us and, for and that, that, that they gave the sacrifice to just help the community around here. Mm. That, I appreciate that. Yeah. This is a pretty good crowd that turned out and this is South Carolina for you. This is the good people to be with. And, all right, thank you, Robert. Do we have any other young ones out there? He was just the first one I saw. And I can't see, you'll have to wave. I see some young ones right back there. Huh? No, a little shy, a little shy. Well, that's quite all right, quite all right. Okay, well, we've, we've had one little injury back here. That's what an ambulance is for, so we're not being raided or anything else like that. It's, it's all right, uh, they're just coming to help somebody. But anyway, as wrapping this up, I've got a list here of people that I told when I got down here I wanted to hug them, shake their hand. And this is what I'm going to call my big thank you list for helping pull this off this week. First off, she couldn't make it. She was going to be here with us. Sue Barnett from Lexington, who helped me bird dog everything and find out about the park and all that. She's stuck at home with a stomach virus. But... I couldn't have done this without her. Those sirens might have been for us if it hadn't have been for Sue. <laughs> Sam McGinnis, who was one of the biker coordinators, led us in our prayer, led us in our national, uh, our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Sam, thank you very much. Steve Waters from the Low Country, getting the bikers rallied and people together down there in the Low Country. There. Thank you, brother. We appreciate you. And those two guys were keeping in touch with me all week long, making sure I was all right and need anything. What can we do? Um, 
Of course, I've already talked about Rose and Ron Merck for the PA system and uh, buying me uh, dinner the other night, Mexican food, that thankfully didn't give me any kind of stomach virus. Uh, Whiskey Collins for helping me out with some logistics and just encouragement and where to get people and who to get where. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, C.P. Carter, uh, I just want to thank you for posting some stuff now and then that made me laugh when I needed to laugh, like after I had uh, readjusted our uh, speaker roster a time or two and said I kind of just made a mistake and too tired, too little sleep, and he posted, said, oh, I got one more thing to add, and I'm like, well, but uh, anyway, I just want to thank you guys so much for coming out. In closing, just to hit on some other points that all this took off this week and it wasn't my doing, it was our doing. And all it takes to do something to make a difference and get people together is just an idea and then somebody else to say, yes, I think that's a good idea. And then to tell somebody else and then it spreads and we as just individual, normal, everyday people can make something happen. Oh, I got a young man here. Come on up here, buddy. Come on. All right. What's your name, partner? Okay. Can you tell us what it is you like about living in America? I just like America. You just like it? Do you like, what's your favorite thing? That there's 50. That there's 50 states that is big? That's pretty good. That's enough. I appreciate you talking to us. You want to say anything else? He thinks that's it. All right. <laughs> like, there's a young man. Come on up here. Come on up here. Because this is part of what is a very big passion of mine is communicating and sharing some of those values of duty, honor, country with this next generation that's coming along. How are you, friend? What's your name? Alex Stevens. What do you love about America, Alex? That we're free and we don't live in poverty. Roger that. Roger that. We're free and we don't live in poverty. We are very blessed. And any veteran that's been overseas, places like Korea, Vietnam, places in the Middle East, you'll see real quickly when you go to those countries that we've really got it good here. We are blessed and we are free because of what that greatest generation did for us and what every other generation has done since then is answer the call when called upon. This has been a great week for me. This has been a good day. I hope everybody has heard something that's given you a little bit of a lift. There's a lot of problems going on. Country, it's sometimes, some days it seems like it's coming apart at the, se at the seams. And I felt like we just needed something a little positive, something to make us feel a little bit better about ourselves, about our state, and about our country. And we were gonna close with God Bless America, but I don't know quite all the way. Our singer is uh, preoccupied back there, our song lead with us, so we'll just forego that. And I would just like to say to everybody, thank you very much for coming out. Thank you for all the encouragement for those who've chimed in this week. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for participating. God bless you. Ride safe, get home safe. Thank you. God bless America. Oh, my singer, our singer, we're gonna wrap up with it. She's here, she's here, okay. All right, we all love America, do we not? God bless America.
Thank you. Everybody be safe going home. And last thing, we've got a couple of trash bags. Uh, if you need them, just police up after yourselves. If you're not military, the translation of that is, like Obama said, make sure you clean up your own mess. Where do we meet so, up? On Facebook? We can meet up on Facebook. You can post back uh, any pictures, stuff like that. Some people have sent friend requests uh, to me. Uh, the other biker groups, I mean... We'll, uh, I'll be trying to post something again this afternoon about a place we can share pictures and uh, look forward to seeing a lot of them in any video clips as well. Thank you very much. Be careful going on.